Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray with ASU in the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. In today's episode, I want to look at a new paper looking at comparing learning to cycle, so skill acquisition in riding a bike. And this builds on some previous work that I've discussed on the podcast. I also discussed in detail in my most recent book, comparing research on a balanced bike and a traditional bike where you use training wheels. And I'm going to talk about this research in a little bit and talk about you know, some of the, the findings, but this research is trying to understand uh, what's going on here. Why, why, is one, why is one more effective than the other? And in particular, it's going to look at the role of functional variability in this. So this paper is by Merced Hall and uh, Keith Davids also as well. Merced did the original study comparing. So they did a study I talked about in my book. And as I said on a previous podcast, what they did was they trained kids uh, for six weeks on a balance bike or a bike with training wheels. And they looked at how well they transitioned to a tra traditional real adult bike. And they found a clear benefit for using a balance bike. And so this paper is to try to understand a bit more about why that exactly occurred. Okay, so a bike with bike with training wheels, you know. So uh, let me go just so we're clear what these are. So a bike with training wheels is the one on the left. So you have a bike with a training wheels, so the kid can't tip over. Um, that's the traditional way that kids learn to ride a bike. That's the way that I learned. Right, you ride a bike for a while, and then your your dad takes the train. Your dad or parent takes your mom takes the training wheels off, and you you go along. This is a balanced bike. A balanced bike has some key differences. Right, it's lower. Um, the kids' feet can touch the ground. There's no training wheels. So they have to, there's no pedals either. They're propelling the bike by pushing off the ground. But critically, they're balancing right from the start. There's nothing keeping them from falling over, right? As soon as they propel themselves with their feet, they have to keep themselves from falling over. So, um, and what they showed in this study, which I'll go over in a second, is a balanced bike is much more effective than a traditional bike, okay? Um, it, the balance of training wheels have been argued to be counterproductive because they're removing uh, the task of balancing and and um, and versus propelling themselves. And in my book, I talk about this is an example of task decomposition, right? The way obviously you need to make riding a bike easier somehow for a new learner, right? But uh, training wheels is an example of a task decomposition. You're taking, you're separating the task of propelling yourself and balancing the bike. Right from you're breaking it apart, you're training one of those at a time, and then trying to put it back together, and it doesn't work as effectively, right? As opposed to somehow simpling it, right? And in a balance bike, the kid is propelling themselves in a slightly different way and balancing right from the start, right? So there are, you could argue that a, learning to ride a bike with training wheels is a completely different task than learning to ride an adult bike, and the research supports this. Right? So those are the two types. This was the previous study I taught, as I mentioned, by the same group of authors. They did an intervention program with kids, either comparing learning to ride with a balance bike and learning to ride, or learning to ride with a bike with training wheels. They found a 100% success rate in groups, the balance bike group, and transitioning to an adult bike with pedals, no training wheels, and only a 75% in the, the, the bike with training wheels group. Furthermore, the balanced bike group, they learned to launch themselves quicker. They wrote all the measures of cycling performance were better than compared to the, the, balance, the traditional training wheel approach, right? So there's clear benefits, right? So what they want to do is ask why, right? And part of the reason they, they feel, right, is when you remove the training wheels, so suddenly the kid is faced with instability for the first time. The possibility that the bike might fall, fall over. And this is leading, this leads to a kind of a fear of, uh, a freezing of the upper limbs and, and encountered productively makes the bike less stable, right? Whereas a child on a balanced bike is having to bounce right from the start, they're not faced with a similar problem. So the question of why this um, what happens is, is there's some speculation why a balanced bike is better, but they want to get into the real details of why it's better. In particular, they're going to look at the role of variability, the exploration in this process. And they're going to use some um, something called the Lapinov exponent, um, which I talked a little bit about on a po podcast. I'm not going to get into exact details of how to calculate it and what it is. It's basically a nonlinear measure. Right? So you take a time series. So we have a time series. For example, we could measure the 
position of the handlebar, the, the position of your handlebars, right? And we'd have a time series of that, the horizontal position. So over time, that would change and move, right? So a Labanaba exponent is a nonlinear method for analyzing the time series, which looks at the structure of the variability. So it's kind of along the lines of uncontrolled manifold analysis, all the other kind of ones we've talked about, right? So people use this, for example, when studying gait. When people have a low Lapinov exponent, that's a evidence of rigidity, freezing degrees of freedom, um, inability to adapt, for example, running over rough terrain. Higher values indicate more adaptation, more variability in the system, uh, quicker responding to destabilization, unchanging constraints, and so on, right? So in general, a higher Lapinov exponent is better, right? So what they're doing is they're hypothesizing that the reason the balance bike is more effective in learning to ride an adult bike is because it promotes better functional variability. It's what you're going to see in this Lapinov exponent, right? We're going to see evidence that there's more of this kind of exploration, higher exponent evidence of variability. So what they're specifically predicting is the balance bike group of greater functionality than the uh, bike with training wheels. So the, the study, they're going to have two periods of training and then they're going to switch to a, 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 the adult bike. There'll be no difference after they switch to an adult bike because they've already learned the task. It's only during skill acquisition. And that children who don't learn to ride are going to have a lower values of the slap and up. Those are the predictions. Okay. So the actual methods, I'm, I can't remember exactly was this the same group of data or was this a separate group of data than from the original study, but it's the same design. So there, this is involved in a learn to cycle program, which is a two week cycling camp with six lessons for the balance bike and a separate group doing six lessons on a bike with training rules, followed by four sessions on a traditional bike. <coughs> so a traditional bike is, uh, you know, it's a bike without training wheels, pedals, right, and scale to their size, like a kid's bike. Um, the testing and the training environments has slope surfaces, obstacles and things on. So it's the same training program that they did in their previous, this previous MERS study I talked about. Okay. So what they're going to do, so they're going to train, they're going to measure the performance uh, before, right? They're going to exclude any kids that know how to ride. They're going to look at after six weeks of training and then after they've acquired um, riding an adult, a traditional bike, adult bike. So there's 22 children between the ages of three and seven. They were split into these two groups, balance bike or bike with training wheels, 12 and 11 each. Um, if they could cycle already, they weren't, they were excluded from the study. Okay. So what they had, how they analyzed this where they had um, IM inertial measurement units, IMUs, on various parts of the, the kid's helmet, their back, various parts of the bike. These are essentially accelerometers, right? They're measuring velocity and acceleration in different dimensions. Okay. So the kids are riding for five minutes in a 10 meter area, no instruction in it without further instruction. Okay. So they're, they're from these IMUs, they're getting a time series of the angular velocity, for example, of the bikes, the seat post, right? The angular velocity of the seat post, they have a total time series of it, right? Instead of just giving one number for variability, obviously they're getting across time, how that's changing for the different planes of move, motion, and they measured that. That's the basic method, okay? Um, so what did they find, right? So first of all, they found all, um, Lapinov exponents were far from zero, suggesting there's positive variability uh, exploration. As they predicted, the variability was significantly higher in the balance bike group during the first two measurement periods before they switched to the adult bike. After they'd already acquired the squill and now they're switching to a traditional bike, there, these differences mostly disappeared. There were still some in certain dimensions, right? So the, during the exploration, when they're losing, uh, when they're using, uh, when they're exploring, when they're learning to ride the bike, they're showing more variability, more of uh, this functional variability as assessed by the exponent, okay? And here's just some numbers, right? So you can see um, for all in the first phase of learning, for almost every measure, the, whether you're measuring from the handlebar, the bicycle frame on the body, the Lapinov exponent is higher for the balance bike as compared to the bike with training wheels true at 02, and then 03, once they've acquired it, those differences are gone, right? So evidence that the kid is exploring different postures, different, trying to learn how to stabilize the bike, developing functional variability, okay? And this is a kind of visual summary showing that there was, you know, higher 
as I mentioned, uh, during the intervention training, there was higher variability uh, in, in lot, almost every measure that you use, uh, lateral oscillations, forward, back oscillations of the bike. Um, uh, the, the, um, so what is this stuff? So the laponomic exposure is calculated through angular velocity. It's showing that kids are, when they're learning, they're having greater variation. So their um, they're child are making more postural moves, right? They're learning to balance, right? They're falling over and then controlling it. Um, they're adapting their postural control and exploring more body positions, more ways to balance. They're developing functional variability. Um, they're, this is increasing, right? As they're going from first learning session, 01, to second learning session, 02, which is again, what we would expect right, if the kid is exploring and developing this functional variability with a balance bike. Um, so there's that, this seems to support the hypothesis. Um, the balance bike proves to me, it seems to be more effective because it allows for more exploration of that balance, more um, development of, of, of functional variability and something we've ta talked about before, more movement from freezing degrees of freedom where you're keeping all rigid and trying not to fall off, right? To freeing degrees of freedom where you're using your different body parts to balance the bike and keep it under control, right? So keeping the task whole, keeping the balance part, a uh, component right from the start and simplifying it by lowering the bike down the ground and letting the kid use their feet to propel the bike instead of the pedals seems to support this functional variability as shown by this experiment. Right. So again, I think this is a really interesting study. It really, for me, nails home is a great example of the problems with task decompositions and task decomposition and how task simplification is just a better way to do things to make the task easier for a new learner. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Thanks for joining me. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.